in the story circle. I need you to be really clear about that and not raise your hand. Everybody else who's gonna be participating, I need you to raise your hand just so that I can get a visual, get a sense. It'll be one hour, the story circle. It'll be one hour. Got it? Okay, great. Okay, so this is what we're gonna do. I'm gonna lead you through the process. Can we come closer? so that we can lead, go through that process. And actually, let's just go ahead and start bringing maybe a few chairs into the space. personal story, not necessarily a story of someone you knew, but like from your own, from this place, from your own experience, because that's how we learn. It's an opportunity for you to tell that story from that space and for us to learn. So it's talking and it's listening, two really very important things, most important parts of it. There's the talking portion, there's the listening portion, and there's some things that happen in between, right? We put emphasis on the listening being essential and probably more important than the talking portion. And why is that? Because we're in a debate-oriented society. We're always locked and loaded. And so it's important for us to listen as much as we talk. So I'm gonna lead you through a few of those things. And I'm gonna share this because there's so many people. I'm gonna share this mic. It's a lot of people who know and are in the room and I wanna honor that. And so if we can go through a bit at a time kind of steps in story circle processes, one important one I'll share and I'll start is sitting in a circle, which is really important, right? And part of that, um, you want to be able to connect to people and to see people. There's power in that. Yeah, another one would be uh, no crosstalk. So as Stephanie said, it's really about listening. So if uh, somebody says something I really disagree with, I can't uh, get on. I gotta wait till the circle comes around and then tell a counter story or a story that uh, somehow uh, answers my complaint. Um, when we do story circles, um, we uh, establish the Vegas room very often. Um, because story circles sometimes bring up stories that are confidential or um, that only need to be shared within that group. So um, we always make sure that people feel safe and that they feel that the story circle is a, a safe and confidential space. So we call that the Vegas room. What happens in the story circle stays in the story circle. Be present in the space and be respectful of other people's stories. Silence is good. It's okay if you take a few breaths in between stories. Listening is essential and uh, one of the great yields that you get from, from the process. Is about stories, not necessarily about your opinions, which is sometimes a really hard thing to do if you start to hear a story that um, brings up your opinions about something. It's hard to remind yourself to stay in story as, a, as opposed to start uh, pontificating on your opinions about that story. So staying in story. My students love to sit in circle and need to remember to help them do that. It's a very empowering place, and they're hungry for it. Every story is valid. Stories have a beginning, a middle, and an end.
I didn't have anything to say. I don't know what I've been like. <laughs> um, don't sit during the circle trying to think of what story you're going to tell. Trust that the circle is going to let you know when your time comes. And if it hasn't, you can pass and it can come back to you. In order to give everyone the same, uh, everyone has the same amount of time to tell their story and uh, keep time for each other um, so that we can, uh, each story can't have the same value as far as time within the space. Any other things? Listening means not thinking about what you're going to say when the person is done while you're listening to them. Now, we've given you some parameters for that, and we, admittedly, this is moving a little bit quicker than typically we would have taken for this. We are going to break up into four circles, is it? Five circles. Five circles we're going to break into. Um, and they need to be even circles, so we need to do a count of, yeah, one, two, three, four, five, a count of. You ready? Okay. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. If you are one, raise your hand. If you are one, can we come over here to this corner with Dudley? Dudley's this dapper gentleman right here in blue shirt and cowboy boots. Walking off to the side. <laughs> if you're two, raise your hand high. So you're going to go with this. Lovely young lady right here with the fly kicks, they're red. Show them. There we go, Miss Linda. Where do you want to go to? She's going to this corner over here. If you are three, raise your hand. Good. You're going to go. Wendy, where would you like them to go? Right here in this corner, Miss Wendy O'Neill, right here. Our fours, raise your hand. Okay, my fours. Uh, Teresa, are you okay? Right here. Fours right here.
And so we're going to take three minutes each in the group. I go. I want to make sure we're all hearts and minds are clear on this. We're going to do three minutes each. Yes? You already have somebody identified in that group that can help you if you have any questions. You might want to do a quick review if anybody has questions right off the top. That means we're going to go for, we're going to do a report back. So three minutes each, about a half hour. I'll check in with you. I'm going to float. I'll check in with you to make sure that you're okay. We're going to check about a half hour later. Okay? And then we're going to do another round. And we'll do a report back. Okay? All right? The prompt. I gave you the prompt actually in the very beginning and I'm going to repeat it. For some of you, you have a different connection to FST. You may be an FST member, you may be related to an FST founder, you may be different intersections, or your connection to FST may have been this weekend. We want a reflection on that. It's very big, but I trust it. <laughs>
not watch them and go and see them. So I was just out of high school, and then I had some friends that were acting in high school, and we started going to some of the different uh, plays and so forth. But for me, it was uh, a sense of pride uh, as you know, as a young woman uh, right out of high school, knowing that um, this is theater. We're doing theater. So I guess that's my story as far as what I would like to share, a sense of pride and uh, knowing that part of me was, was, was a big deal. You know, it was just a big deal for African American women to, to know that we were acting, you know, and people were just, you know, it wasn't television. So that's what I would like to share. I'd like to being at the conference, um, John O'Neill and Gilbert Moses uh, part of what I did besides being an educator is a literacy project uh, on two little colleges campuses where we started with the theater. They thought of me as like the visual artist because um, he was a professor on campus, an art teacher, German art teacher who um, had a studio, he taught art history and art, studio art, and he had a, a place that anybody who was interested in art, because he wanted to really promote it, he could go by his house and get uh, the key, or he would open the art studio for you to go at any time, of day or night. And um, so uh, in the Literacy Project, he was a graphics designer, um, and he used to go to the studio, and I used to go to the studio and others. So, something that I also did that uh, I think that John really did, didn't think about it that much because um, it was dance. And I had always been a dancer from a very early age. That was, a, was just a month, uh, as much part of my life as the art, the visual part. Um, so, I had, in anticipation of dance being an important part of the theater, I identify students on campus uh, to be in my dance group. I was going to have a dance group. And so I would um, practice with them. And um, so one time, I, or a couple of times, I went from my practice to the studio. And I had my leotard. So the graphic designer made, uh, painted a picture of me with my leotards. And I had really that picture is in our bedroom. And I, I, nobody really sees it. And, uh, but by being here and talking with Maria, who performed, and uh, she thought of ways that we might be able to collaborate in the future, um, made me think about that part of what I had envisioned, dance being an integral part of the theater. And I see that it's happening already with Junebug and uh, the urban bush women are collaborating. And so I just, uh, I was glad to have that, those memories again. And um, Maria was talking about Pearl Primus and Catherine Dunham, who were uh, pioneers of African American dance. And I told her, I said, well, you know, Pearl Primus was an anthropologist and she you know, loved dance, so was I. Catherine Dunham. I had a relationship with both of them, and so that was really a story I wanted to keep in mind and to share. Sure. This is probably my first, I'm Bob Martin I'm from Kentucky, this is probably my first direct experience with the Free Southern Theater, and I just felt, I didn't exactly know what I was going to receive, I just really felt I needed to be here this weekend to receive and to be open and to learn, to learn where um, the work that I'm called to do as a, as a theater artist who believes in social change and transformation and to know that, um, I mean, people have said things like the shoulders we stand on and I kind of have a problem with that metaphor. I don't know that I want to stand on people's shoulders, it sounds a little painful, but definitely the foundation has been built more comfortable for me by by this amazing group of, of people here 
and and I'm also feeling just part of that connection is just understanding the connection between where I'm at in the mountains of Kentucky um, and the theater that's happened there in connection with the theater that's happened in the in the Gulf Coast and the Delta and the Junebug Jack story that's the Apple Shop Roadside and and Junebug Free Southern Theater have collaborated on and just that that, that river and the water from the mountains to the to the Gulf has been going on for thousands of years and those stories following that river. So I think I say that just because it's I'm following intuition to be here, to be present, to listen, to pay homage, to learn, and then to find collaborators from this group of folks of all different generations. Um, so that when I do move forward, I move forward with more foundation for myself. So my story, I guess, is that it's just about you know, listening to that intuition and being called to, to be here. And um, I think I'm in the right place at the right time. <laughs> My name is Francesca Mendesi. I moved here in 2009, and I moved here for an AmeriCorps job as a part-time garden, a full-time garden teacher for AmeriCorps. And I had studied theater, but I had studied in a very traditional sort of school where the only thing that we had learned was the commercial value of idea of success in a theater sort of career. So I felt pretty jaded by my training and didn't really see, I thought it was a waste of time. So when I moved to New Orleans, I thought I'm just going to focus on teaching, I'm just going to focus on environmental work that I'm very interested in. And literally, the first weekend I was there, I met Rebecca and Moise with Art Spot, and she told me about a June bug story circle workshop. And when she told me about it, I remember we were sitting on a porch together because we were both in the Save America program. She was telling me about it and I, I didn't, I couldn't imagine that that was actually real. That was actually happening and I think that I was at such a crossroads with the way that I created work and how I wanted to do theater and that she was basically telling me that what I was looking for was happening the following Thursday. <laughs> so, so then I, those ideas of just focusing on my job went out the window and I ended up doing this Junebug workshop with Kyoko and a lot of the people that started, that ended up being part of Lockdown. And that a lot of the stories that we shared in that project are still living on in Lockdown. And that, that experience was really transformational for me and, and that now the theater work that I do is such a huge part of who I am and, and, who I, and, and why I'm in New Orleans and that had a lot to do with being in that space. Um, I'm Karen Atlas, and I was um, working as a producer at DTW Dance Theater Workshop in New York, um, and, and being an activist with artists, and feeling like the work was very disconnected from reality. <laughs> and I got kind of urged to attend the funeral in the Free Southern Theater. And I had no idea what I was going to. But once I got there, I knew that that was what I was looking for also. And um, that, that theater could be so connected to other things in a way that it wasn't in the way I was doing it. And I remember at the funeral that um, somebody was telling me a story about the, the casket and people brought their momentums and their stories and put it in the casket. And I was so incredibly moved by that. And then somebody said to me, would you mind watching the casket for a few minutes while we all uh, go off? Um, and somebody will come back for it. And it was me and Ruby Lerner, also from New York. And they didn't come back. <laughs> and we were sitting there in the park with the casket. <laughs> and the legacy of the Free Southern Theater. And we were these two you know, white girls from New York. <laughs> And I don't know, something about that moment with the casket, I mean, more than a moment, it was about an hour with the casket. Um, it just really pushed me off the edge. And I went back home and I decided to leave New York. And I um, moved to Appalachia, where I then got to direct a project that John O'Neill and Donna Cog had put together all the American Festival projects. So sometimes it's good to sit quietly while <laughs> so that's what happened to the casket. It just was there. Just Somebody like, got it, finally. Oh. <laughs> um, I'm 
I'm Jerry Strutt again. I'm a theater artist, and I guess my story would be about coming from way outside uh, and being welcomed. Um, uh, I'm an impatient artist and a classically trained actor, director. Uh, had began to believe that the power of theater would come from ensemble and that uh, a group of people working together over time would make work that would make a difference. And that does happen, but I became impatient with it. And in the late 90s, uh, because I was doing one of her other plays, and I was already working in story, uh, trying to find things, I was afraid to interview people, um, I met Joe Carson. And uh, Joe Carson was a, a playwright and a, a co-founder with John, Open and Roots. And, uh, she began to say, teach me. She began to teach me. We ended up working together quite a bit. But through her, I learned about FST, I learned about Junebug, I learned about John. They were legendary to me. I read everything that I could. And I'm in rural Pennsylvania. I'm a white guy in a white theater company, just being inspired by what was happening, what had happened. And began to work more, began to work more in the Deep South began to do story circles, began to learn through Joe and through the reading. Finally, um, I met John for the first time and it was like meeting a rock star. <laughs> I was at a conference that I was presenting at Brown that Eric N. had put together, Arts of the World. And John was there and he was doing a story circle workshop. And 90 people showed up. And uh, John's looking around saying, hey, Called me over. I'd never met him. He said, Hi, I'm Jerry Strong. He said, Yeah, I know who you are. Can you take half the group? <laughs> and it was like, Oh my God. <laughs> and um, since then, we've gotten to know each other a, a bit better. Our lives have intersected in several wonderful ways. But, but for me, um, this is a place of genius. Changed my life and has allowed me to learn how to help other communities tell their story, own their story, change their situation, and I've been able to do it in many places around the country. So that's my intersection uh, via Joe Carson and John O'Neill. And if you don't know Joe, you know. <laughs> I grew up in New Jersey, went to school in Vermont, and um, now I'm here. I uh, just graduated in June. I guess I first heard of Free Seven Theater very recently, just last fall, reading Jane Cohen Cruz's book, uh, Local Acts. And, um, and that book actually sent me on a, a little bit of a journey. Um, introduced me to the Los Angeles Poverty Department when I worked with them in San Francisco Lime Troop. Um, and came to New Orleans, I'm planning on actually moving to New York in December, but came to New Orleans to open doors here and to be able to lead a double or more life between here and New York and, uh, and to learn more of the, the histories of democracy and arts and um, so this is one of this is my first direct interaction with the Free Southern Theater and it's been really I knew as soon as I heard about this conference that I needed to find my way here and figure that figure out how to attend this um, because I want to make work in a similar vein and understand um, how to pursue the dream of, of democracy in America um, through making theater and collaborating with people. And in order to do that, I feel that I need to understand the history of that work uh, and learn um, from people who have come before to take that foundation uh, and work with that. So it's been really amazing to be here and to hear from, uh, from people who are part of that, people who have been taught by. 
by Reason for Me. And um, yeah, it's just incredible. I remember going, because I've been volunteering, I remember going through um, the name tags and just recognizing like, all of these sort of names of people that I'm like, oh my god, I've read about this person. Uh, so, yeah, it's been really exciting. I'm John Seeger. Um, I was, uh, in the 60s, I was a veteran in the Civil Rights Movement. I was part of the Ethnic Folk Arts Center in New York City, and we put on a festival for the Statue of Liberty Centennial. We had four stages in Lower Manhattan for, for four days over the Fourth of July weekend with dozens of traditional dance and music and theater companies from all over the world. But then we moved to Ithaca, New York, my wife and I, and didn't have a job. Then John O'Neill and Dudley Cock the American Festival Project, which I didn't heard of. Uh, I got hired by Cornell to coordinate this. Having come off one big festival, I got hired. And for me, it was, um, um, it brought together these three these strands of social justice, cross-cultural um, engagement, and the arts in one place in a way that I never expected. I didn't even know that those three strands existed. So when I was doing that project, I realized, oh my God, this is this is what this is what my life is about. I didn't know it. So that was a really um, and, and then just meeting these extraordinary people who, whose lives, whose theater, whose work came out of their own lives, out of the lives of their communities, was um, it was really transformative. And that's so. And I had not been back. I haven't. I've been doing other things for a while. So I, when I found out this was I had to come back here and reconnect with folks that I already knew and made me that I didn't get. So it's kind of wonderful. That's why I'm here. I'm so glad. I'm Kate Hurton. I work with alternate rooms out of Atlanta. Um, I am the finance manager there, so I don't really have. I haven't done theater my whole life. I've been here. Um, got a, a very new connection to uh, to free southern theater and to the students who watch the roots. Um, I think for me, it's uh, this whole weekend has just been. I, I grew up in New Orleans. I spent most of my life here. We moved away about ten years ago, and I think it's like it's just like this other whole layer of history and of, uh, you know, part of the, the development of the city and, and, and I've all, always felt like, um, I grew up in the suburbs, but I've always felt this really special connection to New Orleans, to the music, the culture here, and I feel like I have this whole other layer of, you know, knowing the struggles that, that went into, uh, with the civil rights movement and some of the art that was made. It's just been really transformative the way that I see, you know, a place that, you know, buildings that I've seen my whole life <coughs> down the street. Like, I finally understand, you know, the really important things that happen here. And <laughs> it's also great to be in a, in a place where, you know, because lots of feelings come up and you know, questions and things like that, to be here with my coworkers from Roots who kind of 
give me a context for that and give me a safe place to kind of talk about that and to be, you know, really open and honest about, you know, some of the questions that I have. So, um, yeah, it's just, it's just been wonderful and I'm glad that I didn't have a, um, I can't say that I had a real, like, work-related need to be here, but I'm glad that I weaseled my way onto the trip and, you know, and made it happen. It's been, it's been really special. Theater was right after Hurricane Katrina. I'm a teacher, um, and at the time when Katrina happened, I had just started graduate school in English up in Boston. Um, but once the storm hit, the only thing I really wanted to do was to move back home. But um, but we couldn't move home for many reasons, partially because our parents' houses were being were torn apart, and you know it was just a traumatic time. So we weren't going to be able to move back home. So my only way of kind of dealing with that fact problem of not being able to be here full time was to try to get involved in what I knew best, which was teaching and trying to help the schools, all the New Orleans public school teachers were fired after the storm, including my sister. Um, and I knew that there was going to be some kind of big upsets and disruptions going on in the school system and I wanted to get involved. So I went to a writing workshop that Kalamu Yassalam was holding at Douglas High School in the Ninth Ward. Um, and when I walked in the room, I had heard about Colombo, obviously, it was an English, you know, English major, and you know, I studied poetry and writing from my home city my whole life, so I, I went to the workshop mostly to see Colombo because I'd heard about him and I, I wanted to know more about him. Um, and when I got to the room, I couldn't really tell who he was because I was looking for the big wig. I was looking for the, you know, who's the person at the front who's important? Um, but it was people sitting in a circle. It was students and adults and teachers all sitting in a circle sharing their writing and, and also giving feedback to each other. And I finally figured out which one was Kalamu. But it really took a while. And um, I was just became obsessed with that, that mode of teaching um, and, and the mode of, of writing. I'm mean, being in a community of writers where you could be 16 or you could be 65 and a world-renowned poet. And you're all going to sit in a circle. It was a story. They use a a workshop method that's grounded in the story circle and also in the Freezen Theater Writers Workshop, Black Art South. Um, so I just started hanging around and following Palamu and Jim, his, part his partner, um, at Students at the Center as much as possible. I started you know, getting my parents and my in-laws to buy me tickets home. Um, I would help them re rebuild their houses, but I would also sneak you know, a couple days in at Douglas High and watch this teaching. And um, it just profoundly changed my life. Um, and, and now I, I work with them. And yeah, and, and I guess it led me to, to, to do a lot of research and to learn the history of, of where that work came from. And I've written a lot about it. So. I'm Caroline Sampson. I'm a senior at Tulane. And I don't know how I got so lucky, but I've always known about June Bug and Free Southern Theater. It's all because of my family. I blame the Wegmans over there. But it's just what I've known to have that privilege of knowing about Free Southern Theater and it's just always been in the back of my head. But in the past two years, it's definitely changed my trajectory and I started researching community-based arts and focusing on New Orleans and that's definitely part of why I chose to come to Tulane. I'm only a senior now, so I can only reflect on my time here so far, but I just know that it's worth talking about still and this weekend has helped remind me about that can sit in Amistad and look through the archives for as many hours as I want. But being here has helped reinvigorate that experience and that enlightenment on what else there is to look at and trace their influence and legacy. And I'm so excited to get back later today, tomorrow, and just start reflecting on the weekend. I mean, from start to finish, from my start as an intern at Junebug to my next steps, wherever it may be, like, I just know that this will ground me in all my future work. I'm so confident in that and so excited because I'm at that point where I get to do whatever I want. I mean, in theory, that's what people tell me. They ask, you know, what are you doing next year? And the easy answer is I don't know, but I know that this will help decide that. And this will play a huge part in it wherever I am. So I'm so grateful for all of you just being part of this experience. It's really going to impact me in the long run.
Um, I'm Catherine Jean Cricket Nine. That's my southern name. Um, John calls me Cricket because my mother calls me Cricket. So um, I came into the world with one fist and a revolutionary fist, and the other hand making a jazz hand. And I knew that I wanted to do the arts, and I knew that I wanted to be involved in, I thought, politics, because that's what I equated social justice with at the time. Um, and I think I instinctively knew that politicians were great actors. And it took me a long time to find people and groups that were doing both. And, and fortunately, I, I did find it. And I started working with Teatro Campesino a while back and through my research with them, every time I looked them up, I'd see something about Free Southern Theater. So eventually I said I'd really like to research, sort of compare and contrast and find out were, did they know each other, were they working together, were they aware of each other. And through that I, I met John and um, I like to tell a story on him that he I said, can I phone interview you? And he said, yes, 7 a.m. And I said, New Orleans time? Or I was in Arizona at the time, and he said, New Orleans time. And I said, okay, well, that's 5 a.m., you know, in Arizona. And he said, well, make a good pot of coffee. So, so I woke up at 4.30 a.m. so that by 5 a.m. I would be grounded and ready for this interview. And I think we talked for like two hours. And in the tape of the interview, you can hear me saying, well, the sun just came up, so I guess it's time to start the day. And, and then it just unfolded from there. And um, so my relationship to FST is very much connected to my relationship with John. And it's just brought me to so many amazing things and so many amazing people. And I got to bring him out to Arizona State where I did my PhD. And I've gone into repeatedly come back here, so I also love that it's kind of like I have a through line of different relationships with it in different parts of my life. And now I get to teach it because I have my PhD and and I get to teach my innocent victims. And um, and I just have to share that I found out on my 30th birthday that John and I have the same birthday. He was turning <laughs> something uh, <laughs> the same day. And so now every day when I celebrate my birthday, my first thought is I have to call John and I don't even care anymore who's calling me for my birthday. And I told him and I really believe this. I said, well, my soul must have picked this day so that I could follow, follow in your footsteps. And I, I feel very proud of that. Um, I'm Kate Grover. I am an intern with Junebug, and um, I got uh, my first connections with FST were through being a Tulane student. Um, I was in a class um, with Catherine, who was my professor for um, two semesters last year, and um, that's when I was a sophomore. And I first, I first learned about Kalamu and his work. And then I was in a class where we went to um, McMain High School, and it was a kind of this disruption of the kind of paternalistic service learning method that Tulane has. And we actually really tried to learn by being in this environment and you know, having a class that was part McMain students, part Tulane students, but everyone was on this equal level. And so we got to read about organizing in New Orleans. We got to read about Free Southern Theater, and we had. Yeah, we had John O'Neill come into class, and we had Wendy O'Neill come in and speak to us, and Miss Doty, and it was just this really amazing, amazing experience to have that I don't think I really appreciated um, in the moment. And so this weekend has been just so amazing because it kind of has made me realize how lucky I was to have that experience. got involved with Junebug through the class with Stephanie and Kyoko come in and talk to us as well. And um, I was really lucky to kind of be exposed to the theater world and what it means to use arts 
as a form of political organizing because that's, you know, I come from a, an English and American studies background, so it's a completely different way of thinking about those kinds of things. But I just, I feel so lucky now, and it's kind of a mixture of sadness for not taking advantage of what I had then, but also knowing that I have this opportunity now, and it's just been a really amazing weekend. Um, I'm okay, no. Well, FST is great. Um, I was brought into it through Kyoko. Um, she approached me. She saw, saw one of the films I made at some conference, and then she approached me about uh, documenting John, because, you know, they wanted to get some stuff because they were having difficulty of finding footage of John and things like that. So um, we filmed John for maybe five hours one day in the CAC. Like, I don't know if you guys were here yesterday, but the performances and the interview, all of that was over the course of maybe five to eight hours. Um, so when she was telling me about John, I was like, this guy is clearly a living legend. Uh, throughout the nation, in the world, and especially in New Orleans. And um, so yeah, that was how I was introduced into FST. And through that, we went to Atlanta, and Dr. Derby and Mr. Bob let us graciously in their house, and we interviewed her. Um, so that's coming soon, and um, through that, um, we had a beautiful baby, awesome relationship, so. Yeah, FST is uh is okay in my book. <laughs> and June Bug. Well my name is Bob Banks and uh, I'm an actor. Uh, I owe much of my education concerning FST and a lot of the other organizations in my life. Uh, however, before I went into the military, I was also a career military person. Uh, but before I went into the military I'd never been further south than Cincinnati, Ohio. So I'd heard a lot of things about the South. Uh, my parents were from both from Georgia. Uh, I had never been there, and I only knew the things I had read about. They were like legends, <laughs> not necessarily favorable ones. Uh, there was a, a mystique connected with that. When I went overseas, I started reading information about uh, Core and SNCC and all those kinds of organizations. And I was surprised I hadn't heard about any of that when I lived in Ohio. Uh, but the Europeans in particular were very inquisitive about things like that. They were very frank in approaching me and, 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 and very, you know, candid about a lot of those things. And that piqued my interest in it. And I thought the first time I heard the term free Southern theater, I thought, well, how important could that be, you know, besides having reasonable admission? Uh, so I really was not into it at all. But I was intrigued by the Southern experience. And I wanted to see what that was all about and see if I could separate some of the facts from what I heard. And uh, I found out that a lot of the factual parts of it, some of it was horrifying, but some of it was very gratifying to know that there were many people, especially people, who didn't look like me, who were interested and had things to contribute to the whole program. I like that because I always felt that we were, shouldn't be ever uh, a one color, one mindset world. Uh, and I was, I was happy that other folks shared in it. That also piqued my interest and so I thought, okay, I'll take this out. Well, I spent a lot of time in a German society and uh, officially and, and, and non-officially, and uh, I found out that they had a lot of the same interests that I did. Um, so that impressed me. And then uh, years later, after I retired from the military, I met my wife, and that whole education began. So today, uh, I'm fairly well educated about what happened. As an actor, I got to work with a lot of people. I, I, I knew uh, Denise Nicholas. I knew uh, Gil Moses, and uh, that was all a great surprise to find out that there were other people interested in all that. 
So this weekend for me has not only been one of support for my wife's interests, but also to fulfill my own interests. So I'm enjoying it. So if we could just take a moment of silence and just look around the circle and remember something from each person or each story. in their life and just knowing that this work will just continue to go on and, and the, the deep gratitude I felt in their group. I also love the idea that we all come from so many different places because even though the Free Southern Theater was rooted in the Black Belt South, it clearly influenced everyone now, whether you intersected with them recently or many years ago. But we've also taken that to wherever we've ended up or wherever you're coming from for this weekend. And that's incredible to have an organization that just started in such a small place to have reached all parts of the nation. That's powerful. I was thinking in terms of astrophysics. And when, when you came up with the idea that says maybe we should do a theater, and the legs stop moving, reflecting on that story, that, um, that that created Time, a, a, a specific gravity, a huge gravity, that each of us were somewhere in the universe getting attracted. We didn't even know it to this place right now. 
in, in the way that that happens in astrophysics. It's a, I don't want to call it a black hole, but let's call it <laughs> let's call it a singularity of idea that draws in people from all over in a variety of ways. It's a powerful, powerful thing when the idea has that much weight and power. So I just got the. Oh, please. Um, what I'm thinking um, is that when something is maybe rooted in one culture, but there's love there and positiveness in terms of goals and not hate in one culture, uh, then it can continue. It can that thread can at any point be uh, shared and it can grow. And so I would ask because sometimes uh, people say, well, it's just certain people doing something, um, then it's, it shouldn't be. It's, it's, it means that you're excluding somebody else or something. But, that wasn't the way it was, and I think that, we, and so that it's, uh, the idea of the group um, it just had that soil was from one from one year, say. but uh, because of the way it was rooted and, and the idea was trying to fix something, trying to deal with something that would be beneficial to people, and so it was able. It wasn't. Just uh, ingrown. It wasn't exclusive, but it was targeted. And so that was really important. So Stephanie is really trying to bring us. <laughs> 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 rich stories in this and this is why it's so important for us to be able to sit in this way and share and to learn from each other. But now we get a chance to kind of share some of the things that bubbled up in each one of the groups. Um, and so if I can bring a mic to you and I hope that that's not going to provide feedback back there but I'm going to give it a shot. If it does, I'm going to book it back on this side, okay? Dudley, is it okay if I start with you? Okay, let me come over there. to not plan what you're going to say, but to truly listen. And the selflessness that that requires, and the 
for me, sort of terror that that induces, <laughs> but how authentically present it forces you to be immediately. And how, you know, somebody mentioned how uh, teachers with all kinds of things about, about building trust and building a community to develop ensemble work, da 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 da, that you can throw all that out, do a story circle, and you can create work from there. Um, did I? Something that we try now, this story circle group, is an understanding um, in our minds and our bodies of history and the intentional ways that our history as black women, as black people, as southerners, as people um, in, like, um, in this state has been covered over and the implications of what that means for us who are doing this work that is so grounded in history and our stories. And um, it really came out in the story circle and um, in the power 
of us telling our stories of our experiences, trying to and actually uncovering that history with superpower. So it's really nice when you land and fall in a place that you didn't expect to be when you had to improvise, but that's the power of being an artist. We improvise a lot. So we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna move back. Um, can I get your assistance? Just with a few chairs over here. We don't need a whole lot. And we're gonna open up the space around here. You can make it one big semicircle, or it can be close to the way that we had gathered before. Get myself back together. But um, as I'm doing that, I, I do want 
want to um, introduce Teresa Holden, who's been a long time. She's been a former board member, former board uh, treasurer, former staff member of June Buck, just there from the very beginning of June Buck Productions. And um, we're really grateful for her contributions to the organization. And there's more work that she's doing um, that will really um, talked about this idea of documentation, so there's a really exciting project that she's been working on for a very long time, and uh, I would like to talk a little bit about that. Thanks, Stephanie. So my name is Teresa Holden, and uh, 30 years ago, last time, my husband, Michael Holden, and partner, here too, began a partnership with John O'Neill and Jimbo Productions in which we have supported June Buck and John in a variety of ways over all these years. Mostly we were finding partners across the United States and internationally for upwards of over 700 different cities and towns, colleges, universities, to bring John's plays and productions and June Buck productions to their audiences. This work also included June Buck's participation American Festival Project. The first American Festival Project was in 1989, and I'm uh, pleased to say that John Souter from Ithaca and Cornell, um, who coordinated that particular project, is here this weekend with us. Thanks, John. Um, we also helped to plan John's and June Boat's residency activities and build many study guides for the community to follow and be benefited by this work. I also served along with MK on and off, as we were called, as managing director to come in and work with John and Jimbo. I was the executive producer on seven of the productions as well. In 1997, we took on a project called the Color Line, which carried out long-term residencies, some of them lasting four to seven years, in seven different cities around the United States. This has been a hugely important partnership in our work, both Michael's and mine, and also in our personal lives. One simply can't partner with John and not be challenged, be changed, and grow. <coughs> and come out the other end being better. Now I really have the great honor to announce the results of our latest endeavor. For the last three years, John and I have been working on publication, along with TCG, Theater Communications Group, of the publication of his plays. The book is to be called The Collected Plays of John O'Neill. And TCG was kind enough, since it's not quite out yet, to give us a lovely applause. Also in thousands of boxes 
to put together the history of the production and to remember all of the incredible artists and collaborators that helped bring these productions to life. The plays that will be included in this book are come under sort of two sections. The first one again we're referring to as the Juba Jago Jones plays. Don't start me to talking or I'll tell you everything I know, sayings of the life and writings of Juba Jago Jones. You can't judge a book by looking at the cover. Tell the midnight hour. Ain't no use in going home, Jody's got your gallon gone. Trying to find my way back home. Like poison ivy, indigo variations. And then under this second subsection that we're referring to as the collaborations, Junebug Jack, wonderful collaboration that Junebug did with Roadside Theater. And uh, um, Promise of a Love Song, co-written with Ron Short and uh, the, the text by Rosalba Malone from Pergonas Theater, again a collaboration, this time between Pergonas Theater, Puerto Rican theater based in the Bronx, Roadside Theater, and Jimbo, and Crossing the Broken Bridge, a collaboration between John and Naomi Newman of the Traveling Jewish Theater. All of these plays, there are nine of them, will be in this collection. What I really find the most important about all of these years probably can't actually be held inside the cover, between the covers of the book like this. It truly has to do with the influence and effect of not only these plays, but the hundreds of thousands of story circles and work workshops and residency activities that accompany this work across the entire United States and internationally. And the effect that this had on the students, young people, college students, adults, across all of these cities, colleges, universities. These plays have been produced in 49 of the 50 states. Alaska is the loser in this case. Um, and many international companies. Um, <clears throat> what I think is so exciting is recently while doing this research, I have been reaching out to quite a few of the people that have had John's plays and the residency work in the different uh, places around the United States. What is fascinating is that even though sometimes it's 10 and 15 and 20 years have gone by, what's happened is that the influence of the story circle method, the different forms of workshop, the different style and method of creating theater or community to tell that community story has stayed alive in these communities. Often being carried forward by the students who learn the technique long after the professors that learned it too are gone. The students actually carry it forward and are teaching their teachers what is important. And I think we all heard that in some of the story circles today from the young people there with us in this evening. So um, finally, what I'd like to say is I think that the influence of this work, of John's plays, and the work that's been done, to me is somewhat like the light of the sea, the shining of the stars. We're really not to understand the effect of it until many, many years later when we see what it really has done in our, from those performances that started simply, or workshops simply in our theaters, in our churches, in our community rooms. I'd now like to mention someone that's not with us, who is Steve Kent, who directed eight of the plays that are in this collection, and he has written a foreword to this book. And he has specifically asked that Linda Paris Bailey share this book with you. Hi, I'm Linda Paris Bailey, and Steve Kent, my brother from another mother, um, has asked me to read this book. So, um, those of you who know Steve, picture me. I'm Steve. So, this is the forward to the collected plays of John O'Neill. Maybe These Young People Can Sit Me Down by Stephen Kent. John and I have worked together for almost three decades. For each of us, it's our longest creative relationship. 
It began in a roots meeting in Tennessee where I saw John perform an early version of Don't Start on a picnic bench in a camp dining room. It hasn't, it hasn't really ended yet. What drew this straight black man who lived in New Orleans and this gay white guy from Los Angeles together is simply that we shared a world view and a commitment to theater as a tool for progressive social change. We also share a belief that the creative process should be available to everyone. We have lived together and created in the cities where the pieces were set, New Orleans, Chicago, San Antonio, Oakland, and San Francisco. We have learned from each other, surprised each other, frustrated each other, and fought passionately. But our friendship was never at stake. We were bonded by the work we knew we had to do. We did it best together. Our creative relationship was a mutual mystery. There is a sequence in a documentary on our work by George King, in which I am explaining to John some character work I wanted him to do. He got it, and ran with it. Later when I viewed the film, I couldn't imagine how John knew what I wanted him to do from what I saw myself demonstrating to him. We always felt that the activities of the fictitious June book had to be consistent with actual history. In Don't Start Me to Talking, the pen penultimate story is set when Junebug is 19 in 1950, and the last I'm sorry, story is contemporary. The piece we were working on was about the 60s and the civil rights movement. We know Junebug was involved in the movement, but, was Junebug, but what was Junebug doing in the 50s? It was a wonderful surprise to us when it became obvious that he had been a medic in the Korean War. His involvement in that war and the issues of black, about black people and the military-industrial complex during World War II, Korea, and Vietnam gave us the core of the third piece, Ain't No Use in Going Home. We also felt that the characters should be consistent with each other. The large Tatum family, from which June Buck's best friend Poe comes, are mentioned in Volume 1, and figure strongly in Volume 2, as do the white oligarchs, the Whitten family. We wanted our audience to feel that these stories were true, even if they didn't actually happen. Hold on a second, I'm gonna scroll down. We were very open to each other. He was the writer and actor. I was the dramaturg and director. But who came up with what it was who came, hmm, but who came up with what is impossible to trace? I know neither of us cared about that as long as the work was progressing well. Sometimes to get the pieces to where we wanted them to be would take years. We are not fast food. There were some basic tenets. It all had to be cheap. It all had to be portable. It had to be accessible. It had to be honest. It was based on stories of the people. It was tra transformational in its nature. By this we mean that the conventions of the piece make objects to change their meaning. A ladder into a jail, or a church, or a locker, a plank into a porch, or a table, a handkerchief into a book, or a piece of intimate clothing, a process that makes direct use of the power of the audience's imagination. For example, John played Junebug, who played many parts, sometimes as many as 30 in a single piece. We wanted the craft to be essentially invisible. Mostly, it had to be really good. If our theater was sloppy, people would probably think that our politics were too. Our country is not good to artists. We are suspect. We are not respected unless we get rich. So we grow to ignore our second rate status. After all, we are not the point our work is, and learn to live and work on very little. We have to subsidize ourselves. It may be said that we have to have jobs in order to do our work. There are fewer and fewer of us still keeping on, keeping on. It is simply too hard for most people. I am full of nostalgia and even grief for the passing of the alternative small ensemble theater movement in the U.S. I remember the feeling of solidarity and support and shared vision we used to experience as part of the movements. Civil rights, anti-war, women's and gay rights. But I am not despondent. Finally, there seems to be stir. There's something happening again. Maybe our experiences will be useful to those coming up. That is why many of us have become teachers. We all would love to pass on the baton. 
as I sometimes hear, maybe these young people can sit me down. Stephen King. wonderful backdrop for our discussion. Absolutely. Hi, I'm Karen Atlas. I'm the director of the Arts and Democracy Project. And um, we're going to have about a 20-minute conversation about story. Um, and then we're going to have lunch. So don't worry if your stomach is growling. It's coming soon. Um, but first, we're going to get some rich food for thought. Um, I first got to know the Free Southern Theater when I attended the funeral, and it was a very transformative experience for me. And it, it basically made me leave New York and come to um, Kentucky, to Abishaw, where I became the director of the American Festival Project, uh, which John and Dudley had created and which Linda um, was a part of. And um, I'd like to think one great revelation for me this weekend is that um, loving disagreement, <laughs> lively um, discussion, is a great tradition that I'm a part of, and we had quite a bit of that in our group as well. So we also had a lot of stories, and um, what I'm going to do here is just um, help, help us um, learn a little bit more about um, stories as part of your work. I think something we, probably a lot of us, discovered in the story circles today is how deep you can go so quickly through a short story. And um, I think something that I'm really interested in is, is how that depth of feeling, when you feel it in your body, um, the relationship between that and the sense that you can make change, that how story gives you agency and gives you a sense of being a part of something bigger than yourself that can help you imagine how change can happen. And that's the feeling that I often take with me from a story circle. So I'd just like to hear from all of you, just in terms of your own work, um, the role the story has played, as you'd like to tell it now. And we're going to make these pretty short so that we can have, um, I've worked with these guys a long time. <laughs> Um, so that then we can have a little bit of a discussion amongst ourselves. Hi, hey, uh, hey. I'm Dudley Cannock with uh, Red Side Theater, Abishaw. All of uh, the work that John and I did over the past three decades was about one thing, people power. It's the center of everything we did, people power. That's what brought the discipline. To, uh, what we were about. So what we were always focused on was audiences. So who's in the house is the first question we always asked. And if it weren't the right people in the house, then we messed up. And we set about to change that next time we're in that community or in the next community we went to. So it's about audiences, who's in the house. And from that central idea of people power, we developed our aesthetic and our content. So one of the premises of our work was that we believed in the inherent genius of every cultural community. So think about that. If you believe in the inherent genius of every cultural community that you're entering into, well, that's going to change your perspective. Another principle that we quickly came to, and this really came directly out of uh, the Free Southern Theater and all kinds of organizing, is that them with the problem got to be the genitive base for the solution. So it's the people with the problem that got to find the solution. We can help them, but uh, they have the knowledge. So that became an important principle for all of our work. And then when it came to content, it was all about finding stories that were counter-narratives. So all the knowledge, the spirit, and the emotion we knew was in the community. All we're trying to do with our plays is frame it up uh, so that that could all uh, reveal itself. So we were trying to help communities uncover the knowledge, spirit, and emotion that they already had. 
So that became an important principle for what shaped our content. So when we started working on a play together, we didn't think, oh, I'm so interested in this and I'm so interested in that. We thought about, well, what might the community need? What could we contribute? And what kind of outcome did we want the, uh, the experience to have? So uh, that was what shaped the content. And what shaped our form and why we collaborated for so long and so well together is that we were both into open participatory call and response form. That's a form throughout the South. It's a form in black churches and white churches. And it's an open, open place where spirit, intelligence, emotion can come in. So we were all about uh, participation. And of course that uh, led to story circles and all sorts of other things. Um, and then we worked a lot to try to achieve scale because we were small, we were small poor people's theater. So then we began devising ways to have the community come in and help us make plays on a much grander scale than we could do just alone. Hi. So again, I'm not Stevie Kent, I'm Linda Paris, baby. Oh. In stereo. <laughs> um, I, I think I want to talk about story as our mission talks about story, and Carpet Bag since 1969 has been engaged in revealing hidden stories. I think in our story circle today, we, we talked a lot about the fact that these stories are not heard, that our history is not there. And our focus very often um, has been revealing those stories, whether they are historical or contemporary, um, around issues that are of interest to our communities. And that's a plural kind of thing because we're a touring company and we create work in our community and we create work with other communities. Um, we have, uh, probably since our origins, created original material exclusively. So collecting stories, um, researching stories, uh, working with communities in story uh, has always been a part of our process. Um, we also work with song uh, very often as, a, as an accompaniment to the story and, and the richness of music in the uh, African American community. We were known uh, for a long time for a cappella singing as part of that theater. And um, that combination of using story and song and building a uh, community through using story and song and zippering in uh, different messages like it was done in the Civil Rights Movement. So that, that is a part of our background of history and story. Um, the story circle process that we, um, we were using um, and that Juba and Roadside and various people were kind of articulating and using has uh, been a part of our values and our value system of what we believe and how we work in communities. So that has been a very important part. But finally, I think what I want to emphasize is where we are in terms of our story sharing and story process now. Back in about 2008, we began, we were introduced to the idea of digital storytelling. And as a part of our ongoing work with story, we determined that this digital process was um, helpful in us engaging with communities and putting the power of story back in the hands of community. And for those of you who don't know what a digital story is, it is a two to three minute a short film, except that it doesn't use film. It's digitally produced so that you have what we call three trains running, which means you have a story, you have a visual image track, so the story track, the image track, and um, you'll excuse this one, the sound track. For those of you who don't know where that comes from, talk to your editors. Um, so we've been using this digital storytelling process and training different communities, um, different um, 
groups of people to empower them to use this technology. And we've also used it in our own work, um, in accompanying the work that we're doing, uh, particularly now, when we're doing uh, work with um, uh, veterans and, and uh, trauma victims of war. And uh, we're using that process to help them share their stories. So, in my little three minutes, I'd just like to, to share that we don't see that work as separate from the work that we do with, it, with live theater. We don't see it as separate from our mission at all. And um, it has been a very powerful tool for us to use and to train other communities to use. I won. Separately and together. Um, we don't have to make a choice between being alone and being together. Because if we're not alone, we can't be together. Right? But the power that comes from stories, that comes through stories, I guess is a better way to say it, is that uh, is the power of our collective struggle to make the world a better place to be in for ourselves and everybody else. Um, and that we who are challenged to be at work in the arts field, um, the main thing we have to remember is it is a field and uh, fields made of dirt, as we are. <laughs> and it takes a lot of work. So, and we can't do it by ourselves, although we sometimes have to do our part of it alone. Mm -hmm. And so, I have to tell you, I'm a little bit, of, more than a little bit uncomfortable thinking at this gathering when I become the focus of something that I don't think I did. Um, I think um, we have done something. Whether we recognize each other in the doing or not, we have done something. We, there's not a one of these people here in this room, on this panel, whose uh, contributions, without whose contributions, we couldn't have, we could have, it, it would have been, I, I can't say it, I, it would have been impossible for any one of us to have done what we collectively have done. And what we will roll forward into the future with. So, understand your responsibility and as a part of this collective. And we are, we are just a small portion of the people who have done this work and who will be required to be present and contributed as we go forward. Uh, there is there millions, billions, quadrillions of stories in each of us. I remember <laughs> my granddaddy who lived next door, Papa, my brother. Who <laughs> they remember Papa? Who had he got the height for Papa? <laughs> I I don't know what happened to my sister and me. We you got it all. <laughs> uh, and Papa was uh, was called to preach. You know, he, he was one of the preachers who didn't go to seminary and didn't go get the the lesson from somebody else. He was called when he was working in fields down in middle 
lives in a sea where he grew up. And he got to uh, Southern Illinois and met this cute little woman named Myrtle Hawk. <laughs> and she became my grandmother because of him. Or <laughs> uh, with him. Or something. <laughs> I don't know what they did, but there was a bunch of children came to them. <laughs> and uh, Papa, as I said, was a preacher. I was the first one of his ten children. And I don't know how many grandchildren they had, I don't remember. But uh, there were three in the army at the time. There was Wendell, the a younger sister. Uh, and the uh, O'Neill family is a fruitful bunch. <laughs> they produce. <laughs> and so Papa uh, uh, engaged me to be his helper on many of his projects. And one day we were working on the roof uh, of Mama's hen, hen house in the backyard. And he, Papa and I were there. And I was running my mouth asking him questions about this or that and the other. He got exasperated after a while and turned up to me and looked at me and said, Son, if you ain't got nothing to say, for God's sakes, don't spin and waste your breath saying <laughs> Don't spend the time and waste your breath. I didn't know exactly how to receive that. <laughs> and process it. I'm still puzzling myself over <laughs> what he said to me that day. And uh, so I'm near the end of my story. had a little bit of time left, so maybe, um, and this is kind of the last session, right, of this? This is. Can I, so, can I ask, ask something of the crowd? Yeah. So here we are with that issue of time, one of those things that just is and we never have enough time for it. So I'm going to ask permission from you if we can do something and adjust it a little bit. There are some people who are going to go on a tour for Cry You Want at the end of the we're supposed to schedule, we're scheduled to end at 1 o'clock, and the bus comes at 1.30 for those that are going on that tour. Other people will be here and be able to stay. Is it okay if we take maybe another 10 minutes, that will be 20 minutes, I'm going to ask you to let the people that are going on tour go to the line first. Is that okay with you? How's that? Can we make that happen between ourselves? Okay, we're going to take an extra 10. You have questions, Karen? Yeah, so I'll ask a question. <laughs> um, I'm curious about, again, this connection between the power story and what you were saying about people creating a framework where people can, can create the solutions to their own problems and um, the wisdom that you find from storytelling. And John, I think I heard you say the power of metaphor in stories. What happens when people tell stories that contradict each other, or tell different versions of history, or a story actually silences another story? How, in your, all of your work, you've done a story, which is very democratic and about hearing all the stories, and how do you go from that to um, the organizing for progressive change? Or how do those two fit into each other? I've got the money, so I'll take a crack at it um, first. Um, I think, you know, we in digital storytelling talk a lot about point of view, right? So every story, every play, every book that you read is told from um, a vantage point, a point of view. And I think you have to look at your value system, and I think you have to look at the experience of the community and establish the point of view of the organization, the company, the community. And once you have that in place, then you begin to shape, you know, uh, the story in the way that it seems to serve most. As John would say, you tell the story for the good of people, as opposed to the 
the lie. Um, but it's, it's, it's value based and I think that um, uh, we cannot be afraid to have an opinion, a point of view. And very often it's counter to the uh, prevailing point of view. But hey, that's us. Who wants it? I'll take it. So, um, you know, I talked about uh, with our work, the, the first hurdle was to uh, get everybody into the room. So, really, uh, things are so segregated and fragmented. Uh, more, it seems now, particularly along uh, race and class lines, than even when we were doing this work um, a couple of decades ago. So, the, the, really, the first uh, challenge we had was how do you get different points of view into the room? so that you can have a contest of ideas. So this is a big, uh, a big challenge for us, uh, particularly, say, Jude Buck Jack. So I talked about how we shaped our content to a need. We thought there needed to be a recounting of the history of poor working class white and black people and what kept them from seeing their common interests. So we decided to make a, a musical drama about that called Jim by Jack. So we used story circles to develop the play, our own personal stories, to write the songs. Uh, so we finally got a play. But then the question became, how are you going to get black and white poor people, working class people, middle class people, in to see the professional theater? They don't go to professional theater. Professional theater is eight out of every 10 people are from the wealthiest 15% in this country. So how are we gonna get these uh, working class, middle class, poor people in? That became a big challenge. The way we solved that was we wouldn't go into a community unless the community agreed to pull together an ecumenical choir. So that was people from um, all the different churches across lines of race and class. They'd get the music a couple of uh, months ahead and rehearse it, and then we'd stage them into the play. So folks came together because there was a big national play coming, and they loved to sing, and they wanted to be in the spotlight. But from that, all kinds of conversations about race and class happened. We can imagine all the churches had to show up to see what their people were doing. All the young people came because there was a new sound being created in the community. community every community is so segregated that people had an often sung across this line, so a new music was being made. So from bringing the people together, then, we could have the kind of hard conversations that uh, Karen's talking about. But those conversations were enacted in story circles. And one of the chief things is, of a story circle is we develop it. You may hate the story, but you've got to respect the story circle, no cross -talk. So we were intentionally trying to bring people on opposite ends together in a circle to discuss uh, what was happening in their community. And of course, the play framed all that. It gave a kind of com uh, permission. So you could say the play was act one. Act two was the community hearing their own voices, often opposing voices. And the thing about the story circle very egalitarian, as you all know, and that's what enabled the harder conversations to happen. Now, they couldn't end with one story circle. A community had to spend, if they were really to deal with this new sort of racing class, going to have to commit to years of, of doing that. But we have a whole methodology that helps support that. I'm, uh... I'm, I'm teaching uh, playwriting, a class in playwriting right now in, in Massachusetts. 
Um, and it's an interesting experience and UMass and uh, and the kids who come to the to the class as I just started in September. Um, when I ask them to tell about uh, theater, uh, what they think, why they want to write plays, uh, what kind of plays they want to write, and so forth. Uh, they start talking about TV. Things they've seen on TV. And the whole idea of theater is, is like someplace else that something happens. It's very frustrating. You know, because TV at its core is a sales meeting, you know, based on advertising, principles of advertising, and so forth, you know. You can count on it. Two minutes into the first scene, there's going to be a conflict exposed, and the rest of the thing, you know, it's just going to roll right out. And two and thirty set two minutes and thirty second bites. Little bites like that. And they don't take it seriously. But it still falls into the shit to shape the way they are seeing the world. You know? It's very frustrating to old fashioned dude like me. You know. I get, I get in there and I start trembling because I'm so mad at what they're doing. <laughs> but I don't get mad and shouting and screaming won't do much good, so I try to get stuff to read. Uh-oh, that was the wrong move. <laughs> and they don't read it. I ask them to make reports on it. They become clearly not having read the stuff and try to bullshit their way through the uh, the report they're coming to make. So something strange is going on in the world. And I just uh, we gotta figure out ways to do it. And if any of y'all have figured it out, please tell me and let me readjust my syllabus to fit what might work. But it's a So the young people involved in the Free Southern Theater Institute, the folks, the young people involved in digital storytelling. Um, so I, I would be interested to hear how this is moving forward, your comments on that, how you see young people using this work, and your hope for letting us see people use it. The other thing I've seen with Free Southern Theater Institute is a support system for people. Maybe the way Free Southern Theater was, I know American Festival Project went on for 10 years and we all challenged and supported each other. So where is that happening now? The places that people are challenging and supporting each other. I mean, I see it at Alternate Roots, I see it um, in the Free, I see it in the Urban Bushman Institute. Where are some of those other places? I can talk about um, what's happening with us. I think, you know, we see it at, uh, in trainings at the Highlander Center um, and the youth work that's going on there with uh, young adults and, and teens. Um, I think that uh, I see it at the, um, the institute that we just did in Minneapolis with uh, directors of color and forming institutes for directors of color. I, I think that, you know, we have to kind of understand that we all want to share our own stories. It doesn't matter what age we are. 
And if we're not listening to the stories of young people, then what are we doing? Um, and I think that the, the way that young people are sharing story and the technology that they're using, and we're, you know, we're, I think we're being a little critical of that, and uh, a little not understanding what that technology is, can do, can be. Um, I think we, we know that the value of personal connection is what we're after. The value of valuing human beings and their stories and their desire for change is really, um, doesn't have an age, doesn't have an age attached. Um, I used to argue uh, uh, with, with some folks at the Highlander Center about the youth program when I was running the youth program and whether or not young people uh, should be working at the Highlander Center in, in kind of shaping things and I was like, um, didn't you guys tell me that you know the guys who were in the street were like 15 and 16 and 17 years old? So why have they become suddenly ignorant? So I think we have to value what young people bring and uh, look at these things in a very different way, keeping the core value of interaction and personal connection and the way that forms movements and struggle. So, uh, Rutsa is doing a, a very practical thing. Uh, we're putting all of our work from the past 37 years up on a web platform, roadside.org. Uh, everything is going into Creative Commons, and so we're essentially going to give everything away for those coming along, however they want to use it. So this came from a conversation years ago with uh, John's and my friend John Holden at San Francisco Mine Troop, and uh, she was trying to figure out how to pass on the legacy of the Mine Troop. So she thought, well, I'll try to train up some young people. And every time she tried that, she realized she had too many things she wanted to do to just fall over and train. She kept interceding. So uh, we tried the same thing, wasn't going to work because uh, it's going to have to be reinvented. Whatever we've done together is going to have to be reinvented in an entirely new way. So what we're trying to leave is, um, it is footprints, if you will, of where we went. And it's going to be up to the young people to figure out where those footprints are going to lead. The chief question I'm interested in uh, right now with young people, people of all uh, ages, etc., is what's the nature of the present historical moment? What's the nature of the present historical moment? I feel like we're sleepwalking. So um, I'm going to hand this to the multiple generations of Juba to end to close us out and send us off to food. This is great, so all three, three generations or more. So we can them. Kyoko is the uh, leader of the educational work that's going on on the name of the Free Southern Theatre Institute. And she was introduced to us by Dan Point. <laughs> Jan, Jan told us, as a young woman in New Orleans, did you ought to read? <laughs> and we met, <laughs> and then we decided we'd work together. Yeah, thank you, Jan. It's, it's really amazing to be here with everyone and uh, see how things come full circle. But uh, I, I don't know if I would say I'm the leader of the educational but I'm, I'm just going to repeat things that I learned from John and just share that um, I think what's really exciting about um, working with stories, um, is that the form and the aesthetic, I think, can change over time. And um, one thing I was really struck by was when Jerome on Friday said that this idea of theater is a prescribed notion, um, but that we live in a very theatrical city and there's performance and theater is everywhere around us. So um, what I've tried to do I think uh, John and I have tried to do with the Free Southern Theater Institute is use stories as a jumping off point 
but those stories find their ways into different forms. Um, yesterday we saw Quest perform, uh, uh, share some poems, and so we've seen these stories take the form of spoken word and poetry. Um, we've seen stories work their way into dance. Um, and another thing that's really been inspiring to me is a conversation we had with Doris Derby in March, uh, where she talked a lot about um, this idea that the theater could be an umbrella for different forms of performance and art, including visual art, other forms of art. So I think that's what we try to do, is um, uh, figure out what different people's assets are, what their they're, they're inspired by what their desires are, and rather than trying to create artists of one kind, we try to build on what their interests are, what their strengths are. And, and, and like Linda was saying, you know, I think everybody has a story they want to share. Everybody wants to be heard. Uh, so we try to nurture that spirit and through stories. So I want to thank, I want to thank the panel. I, um, we pushed a little over time. And we want to let everybody have a chance to get some lunch before they have to leave. But um, so a lot of you are staying. Those of you who are taking the bus, if you could, you could they could go first in line. Yes. And I'm going to pass this on to to Stevie. But I want to thank everybody on the panel, and I want to thank Junebug for bringing us all together.
get really the other way.